Right, the next topic I wanted to cover is to do with high availability. So this is where we move on to the cost drawer capabilities. How we can have services fail over from one machine to another. Now, in the database itself, we've had service failover between instances for some time. You know, it first appeared back with version 9, but with version 9i, it was all manual. Uh, became much better, of course, with version 10G, the automation came in, and with 11G, even more automation still. Now, but grid infrastructure with 11.2 introduces the possibility of database or instance failover between nodes. We can actually have a database failover from one computer to another. And that's the sort of capability that previously one would probably have had to use HP Service Guard or perhaps IBM HACMP to get some sort of equivalent functionality. Now grid infrastructure can fail over a database from one machine to another. Given my slight problems with this cluster, I shall just have to hope that this will actually function. But you never know, we shall see. Now, what I do want to do is demonstrate a database failing over, if I can. The technique is to create what we call a server pool, an SRV pool. So the detail of this we can study subsequently. So create a server pool, and then I need to assign a database to the pool. So I'll connect to my database home. I've pre-created a database, by the way. I created the database in advance. And then register the database with grid infrastructure. So I'm adding a database to the grid infrastructure and registering it. And I'm assigning it to this pool, RDB pool, that I created earlier. So a pool of servers. Now, how big is your pool going to be? Well, if you are a site with 50 computers and you've clustered the lots, you probably wouldn't put all 50 into one pool. You might have one pool for your production servers, one pool for your development servers, one pool for your test servers, and so on. But I only have only two nodes here. So I've created a small pool called RDB pool, and I put both my nodes into it. And then I assign my database to the pool. Now, add the database to the pool. But the pool has a couple of extra switches here. The pool has a name, RDB pool, minus L1 minus U1. That is an instruction to grid infrastructure, L, at least. I'm telling grid infrastructure to activate at least one server in this pool and activate up to one server in this pool, which is a long-winded way of telling grid infrastructure, I want one active machine in this pool. Which will that machine be? One of those two. Now, I'll start up the database with SRV CTL start database. And start the database called RDB that I created earlier. Now, I have no idea on which machine that database is going to start. I really do not know. Uh, grid infrastructure would follow its own load balancing algorithms and start up the database on one of the machines that is in that pool. Only one, because of the way I've configured that. Now, oh, where has it in fact started? I could control this, of course, but I'm relying purely on trusting Uncle Oracle at this point. Status database minus DRDB. And it has in fact started on the node iron one. I didn't know that, but that's where Oracle has chosen, to, or grid infrastructure has chosen to start it. And there it is. Well, how do we fail over to another machine? What's the most brutal way to fail over you can think of? Well, I shall cause a problem. And the problem I shall cause, I'll just reboot the box, which I need to do anyway, since this is the one where my kernel modules weren't running. So I'll shut down minus NR. Now, if I'll kill that machine, just reboot it, gone, right. Well, that will, of course, have terminated the instance. But grid infrastructure should pick that up pretty quickly. And within a few seconds, minutes at most, it thinks it's still running, but of course is not running on the machine iron one, because the machine iron one 
no longer exists. It was rebooted in no uncertain terms. And pretty soon, grid infrastructure will pick that up and restart it. Now, this is the sort of thing that you could do with third-party products. HP Service Guard, IBM HACMP, Veritas Clusterware, any sort of system that will monitor what's going on. Now, it's identified the fact that it's not running on node 1. It's not running on node iron 2 either, but it will be soon. And let me see if it started up already. Grep RDB. It's come up already. It's already come up. So I didn't time it, but that was probably less than a minute. So in less than a minute, the entire database failed over to another machine, which is pretty fantastic. And given the grid infrastructure clustered storage as well, and the way we'll build independencies, the disk groups containing the data that database instance needs would also be remounted on whatever machine it failed over to. Very nice indeed. Very cool, John. Very cool. A couple of questions in the queue. Is this a good time? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, one question is, if the database is active during that failover, what about the current transactions? Are they lost? Ah, that takes us on to the next aspect. That's a very timely question. Um, that takes us on, really, to the next part of what I was going to talk about, which is the fault tolerance from the, from the client side, how it views, it's viewed by the client. If we look at, so I might as well show you now, actually. Uh, if we look at what we call services, FRV, CTL, if I want to add a service, when we define a database service, um, we can define session failover with failover time. Oh, this is actually my 12C environment. Okay. With when we can configure session failover to none, and in that case, all sessions against the failed instance or the failed node would die and would have to re-establish re manually. We can have the session failover, but any work in progress would go. Or we can have select statement failover, meaning that a session is logged on to the instance the machine or the instance fails, the session fails over, and if it is in the middle of a select statement, the session will appear to continue. You can continue to fetch from your cursor. And that's as far as we can go with version 10 and version 11. If you're in a transaction, as the question was, well, with version 12c, we can have the transaction fail over as well. But I'm afraid, up to and including 11, the best we can do for you is have the session fail over and select fail over. Transactions will be rolled back with the current release, but that will change when we get the opportunity to take you on to the next release. Very, very cool, John. Uh, uh, I think the last one for this, um, what if an application needs a virtual IP and a file system? Uh, can you link them? Yes, we can. We can build independencies all the way. Uh, let me show you that. Um, again, CRSCTL. I don't have a, I may be able to build up an example. Uh, what I have here, for example, the way the dependencies work, yes, I'll, I'll go through a listener. And that will also take me on conveniently to talking about scan, single client access name. If I look at how my listener is configured, minus P to get the complete page of details. There's a device, uh, a service called Aura Listener Scan 1 LSNR. There's its name. What is it? It's a scan listener. It's a database listener that has a particular purpose. It's a database listener that services the single client access name. There's its ACL, which I mentioned earlier. But down here, we see lower down its properties. Uh, here's some default tolerance stuff, by the way. Auto start how many do we want, and so on. How often do we check that it's actually working? What to do with failovers? We don't delay at all, we fail over immediately. But down here, we see the dependencies. So we can build in dependencies between registered resources, between registered resources. And we have here that my database scan listener has a hard dependency on that. That's a VIP. Hard meaning if that virtual IP address is not running, we cannot start the listener. And that's fair enough. A listener needs an address on which to listen. 
And then we see a clever part here, pull up. A pull up dependency means if we try to start this process, this scan listener, and the VIP is not running, we will start it. So you can build in as many dependencies as you like with all the registered resources. So in the case of a database, I don't have a database registered here, but we'll build in a dependency on, say, certain file systems and on certain listeners as well. So start one on a particular machine, and that will pull up all the other resources, mount the appropriate file systems as required.